If you asked a child to draw a scientist, what do you suppose that child might draw? Well, for 50 years, sociologists have been doing just that. And for 10 years in the 1960s and 70s, almost 5,000 drawings were produced. Take a guess at how many of them were of women. Just 28. 28 out of 5,000. Things started to get better in the 1980s, and of the tens of thousands of kids who took part in the study, about a third of them were drawing women. More than two-thirds still drew a kind of Einstein. One-armed Einstein, apparently. That's where it stayed for 30 years. This was the challenge that I wanted to meet when I created the superstars of STEM wasn't just about addressing the gender disparity we have in science. It wasn't just about rebalancing the public voice of science. It was about asking the question, if we made room for more people and different kinds of people to bring their ideas into science, what would that look like? What kind of future could it create? This idea of making room came from a time in my own life that was very difficult. But it's a time that I hold with deep gratitude because it completely changed the way that I look at life. A few days before my 36th birthday, I discovered that I had advanced non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I had a tumour the size of a football. It was lodged in my abdomen. It was squashing my organs and it was pushing my pelvic bones apart. It was growing very quickly. It was doubling in size about every month and a half. And I was told that without urgent action, I'd be dead within weeks. The year that followed was life-altering. Not because it changed me, but because it revealed me to myself. Chemotherapy and radiotherapy can be brutal. I was young and I was otherwise healthy, but I was also a working single mum of two small children, and I was permanently exhausted. I spent a lot of time by myself in a dark room, in what I came to think of as a kind of enforced meditation. I didn't even have the energy to listen to music. And I came to know myself on a fundamental level, peeling back the layers one by one until I came to the very core. I was freed of the pressure to act in a particular way or to be a particular person. And I promised myself that if I got through it, I would stay true to that fundamental core, stay true to that authentic core. While I was in treatment, others rushed in to help me with the minutiae of daily life. One of my parents or my sisters was there almost every day to help with the kids and to help me run the house. Some friends got together, they paid for a cleaner. Even people in my outer circle showed up with fresh home-cooked meals. These friends and family and acquaintances, they gave their help wholeheartedly and respectfully without any expectation of reciprocation. They freed me from the need to fight on my own. And I came to understand that their generosity of spirit was making room for me to live. They were ensuring that I did disappear. So when I emerged from cancer, emerged from treatment and into the uncertain territory of remission, I carried these two truths with me, authenticity and making room. It was really tempting to shut down to reconstruct my barricades, but I didn't. I opened up, and I found that in making room for myself, I could also make room for others. I could keep shouting from the rooftops about issues that grab me by the heart, and at the same time, I could extend a hand and provide a step up for others to take to their own rooftops. So I began to create pathways to visibility for people whose voices had been diminished. I've helped all kinds of people to grow their voices and push back their limits, but I've had the most fun making room for women in science. I'm sure if you asked him, my high school chemistry teacher would be more than happy to tell you that I've never been great at science. But I have always loved it. The universe is an extraordinary place, and I think scientists have the best jobs. They work at the edge of wonder. It's an enormously creative endeavour, that quest to know. Scientists and technologists are literally building our future, day by day. So it's no mistake that as I recovered from cancer, my first leap was to science. 
But I discovered pretty quickly that I don't love everything about the scientific culture. I kept meeting amazing people, creative, clever people with big brains and huge ideas who were afraid to speak about themselves, afraid to speak about their work. They were quietened by a culture that sees an individual as an interference, that says the work should speak for itself, by institutional structures built around hard-won short-term funding that creates deep job insecurity, and by that pervasive lone genius stereotype that says the only real scientists are older white men in lab coats. You know, by secondary school, this stereotype has been inhabited by girls. They drop out of science and maths in droves. And by the time we reach adulthood, the stereotype is so inculcated that just 16% of people in science, technology, engineering and maths are women. Just 16%. In 2016, I came across the Miller study of school children, the Drawer Scientist study, and I was astonished to find that girls' and boys' perceptions of what a scientist looks like haven't changed in 30 years. About a week later, I read that just one in 10 of the scientific experts quoted in the news media are women. And then I saw a list of the top 100 scientific influencers on Twitter, and only eight of them were women. I got so angry. I wanted and I needed to give room to some of the other voices in science and to work with them to open the door to invite others in too. Because, you know what, I don't want my chances of recovering from a serious disease like heart disease to depend on my gender. I don't want my safety while I'm driving a car to be compromised by systems that are designed for a different body size, a different body shape. I don't want my voice recognition software to listen to me only when I lower my voice, so much that it's strained. I don't want my cities to exclude people who, don't, who can't walk, and I don't want my cities to exclude people who can't see. And I absolutely do not want a future for my children that is created by only one kind of person. <laughs> I wanted to smash that stereotype. I wanted to, to just banish forever, once and for all, the ridiculous notion that the only people who have great ideas to bring to science are older, able-bodied white men. I wanted to show students and teachers and parents that chemists and coders, mathematicians, engineers, physicists, biologists, they're as varied as humans, and so is their work. I couldn't find any program that would do what I knew needed to be done, so I created one. I called it the Superstars of STEM. First, my team and I searched the nation for 30 role model scientists with a knack for chat and a desire to join us in the quest to smash that stereotype, draw a new kind of stereotype. Journalists are overworked and time poor, so I knew that we needed to give the superstars media training and then introduce them to journalists, make it as easy as possible for the media to include them. To get around the Twitter situation, we needed to train them to build a following online, and then we had to help them grow that following, encourage others to follow them. Of course, we needed to teach the superstars to be great public speakers and then send them into schools to connect directly with young people. To help them keep building their careers, we also trained the superstars to communicate with influence one-on-one -on -one with people in positions of power. And then we introduced them to leaders in politics, in business, in the media, and of course in science. But even that wasn't quite enough. I knew that the transition to being a public figure can be an intense and vulnerable time. So I picked up the phone to women leaders, people with their own high profiles, CEOs, company directors, federal politicians. I asked them to donate their time and their expertise and their networks to become mentors to the women we were working with and support them in their transition to superstar status. And I was thrilled and humbled when almost all of them said yes. The superstars are living, breathing proof that scientists come in all colours, in all genders, of all abilities. They work in all kinds of jobs, in all kinds of places. Ships, deserts, zoos, office towers, you name it. 
We're making room for their voices, and the results have been extraordinary. In 2016, one in 10 of the scientific experts quoted in the news media were women. Today, it's one in three. Thank you. Over the last two years, the superstars have visited schools all over Australia, and they've spoken directly with tens of thousands of young people. They've also met and spoken about science with ministers and prime ministers and national and international CEOs. They've built a strong and loyal following online that's still growing. And they've appeared in thousands and thousands of news and feature articles across all kinds of media around Australia and around the world. They're being empowered to tell their stories authentically, to proudly bring their whole selves to the world. They're making room for themselves and each other. But most importantly, they're making room for the girls and the young women who will follow them. This network of sisters in science and technology, it's gaining momentum as the superstars extend the hand of sponsorship across sectors, across cultures and across generations. And their friendships and their connections with each other have given birth to new businesses. They've created new mentoring programs. They've initiated new areas of research. Meanwhile, they're still out there speaking in schools, meeting with leaders and making room. We're now working with another 60 superstars in training, another 60 women in science, technology, engineering and maths who've joined us in the quest to smash that stereotype. After that, I want to work with another 60, and after that, well, it's an international problem, and I want the superstars of STEM to be an international solution. So my next goal is to build the program across nations, to supercharge the capacity to bring so many more voices into science. The superstars of STEM are creating room for a future that's built on and that celebrates unity rather than uniformity. And they're changing the way we think. When school children have met a living, breathing scientist, they're much less likely to draw Albert Einstein. They're much more likely to draw a woman. As we remove the limit of that tired, old stereotype, as we make room for all kinds of people to bring their ideas into science, I can't wait to see what the world becomes. Thank you.